as you can see, I'm here in the middle of the Swedish woods. And uh, I'm here on, on a trip for the next recording for my YouTube channel and some, some other recordings about cybersecurity stuff. But today I'm giving a talk here. I will take you to two journeys. One is here through the woods and the other one is to high performance patterns. And um, well, now the technical trick, tricky thing, I have to start sharing my screen for this. I'm rotating the picture once and we'll search for the slides so that we can start here. Okay, I have to select the slides, give me a second. And then, so, um, the main thing is I will check from time to time if there's something in my sharing. Yes. So you should see my slides, my performance all patterns. Okay, so what we want to talk about today. Today we want to talk a little bit about um, what we can do if you have object-oriented persistence in the end. So this is uh, based on the micro stream topic. And what are the basic things to yeah, to make object-oriented pattern a little bit more performant. So, um, by the way, my name is Sven. I'm developer at Forget for JFrog. And as you can see, I'm not only at this picture in the woods, I'm spending so much time out there because I just love it. Oh, by the, by the way, here it's a big amount of ants. I have to go somewhere else. And if you like this outdoor stuff, then check out my YouTube channel. Um, I have it in German, I have it in English. Make sure that you're selecting the right one and it would be a pleasure for me to see you there as my new subscriber. If you have any questions, feel free to ping me via Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever. The only thing I can't recommend is using email because email is just crap for me. So I'm not really, yeah. So let's see, next one. What is object-oriented persistence? So what's the difference to object-oriented database management systems, what's the small difference, or just in a few words, what's the difference to the relational thing, and how to make this performance. So why, why this is important, or why this is interesting. Quite often I see in projects that um, this is business model, there's this object-oriented model, and then we are talking about persistence, and then there's this big semantic break. And what can I do if I don't have the semantic break anymore? Okay. For this, we have to think a little bit, or we have to, to start um, look at some parts. For example, what is a typical evolution of a model inside an application? Okay. So mostly we have this um, application model. Uh, this is uh, based on, on core data structures. It means that we have here this uh, hash maps, lists, whatever the data, the, the language will give you as data structures. Okay. And you start modeling your business app model um, like this. I have a hash map here. I have a list there. I'm, I'm uh, using the the core elements like uh, integer, byte, boolean, all this stuff, okay? So if you have this one and it fits to your needs, this is mostly optimized for get good accessibility. So I need this attribute. It must be designed in this way. I have this correlation between this attribute and that attribute. The question here is, for example, how are you dealing with big complex models? Are they just linked together? Let's assume you have a big rocket uh, as a model. Um, the engine, is this directly connected to, to the rocket itself? Is this isolated? Um, mostly in the object-oriented world, you have everything together, okay? Because it's, it's just a getter, it's just a setter to, to deal with these attributes. So you have this uh, one-directional, bi-directional um, links between attributes. If you have this language specific things, maybe in Java, you have more or less this one directional things. I have a getter, but from this to go back, I need a dedicated getter back, okay? Nevertheless, um, mostly at this application, if you have this uh, app model, then it's going to some kind of caching layer because everybody is more or less discussing about the uh, performance issue. We need more performance. Uh, we, we have to deal with this one. We have this cache or that cache. Uh, if it is a JCache implementation or whatever cache implementation, I don't care. Mostly what you have here is a first semantic break in your application logic because you have to 
to change the model based on technical requirements for the cache itself. So you have to decompose attributes. You have to uh, switch between types. For example, okay, the caching layer is not able to cache hash maps. So you have to reformulate the model at this point, okay? And at this point, mostly what's happening is that you're breaking apart the, the core business model. So you're breaking it apart in, in uh, elements that you want to have performant and you hold that you're not losing the connections or you have no, um, let's say, uh, things in, in this model that will give you a double meaning or misinterpretation potentials. Okay, so mostly it's so you have this big, uh, big model and then you are just um, breaking it apart and then decomposing it. Okay, then you have this cache. Uh, this caching layer is mostly just there to, to make things performant. That's the only thing why you have this caching layer. If it is a worst case, you have different caching layers. Uh, there's a worst case. So you have your caching layer inside your app, then you have a caching layer in front of whatever. Okay, so if you have this one, mostly you want to store this stuff somewhere and then latest and at this point, you have the next big semantic break. The semantic break is at this point that you have mostly an inter-process communication. It means you're leaving your process with all the pros and cons um, because if you're leaving the process, you have to wrap and unwrap your data or you have to serialize it. You have to, to change the data types. For example, if you're using a Postgre, then you have to make sure that an int is an int and byte is a byte and so on and so on and so on. So if you have this one, you have to break latest at this point, mostly you have to break more complex or comfortable data structures from your programming language means, oh, I have to switch here, means if you have a hash map, how to store this hash map inside this database, for example. So in the end, we have three models. We have the model inside the application layer. We have the model for the caching, the technical needs. And then we have the model for storing it somewhere, okay? Including in the process communication can be good, can be bad, depends on, on your needs or the scalability structures. Okay, so why do we need it? So if we are able to get rid of all this stuff, the caching and the storage layer, then we would have to think about how to make this object-oriented layer more performant. So what, what are the basic things? Okay. If you start thinking about making things more performant, you have to think about what is the behavior of this data? Why should I think about it? Because if, you, if you're just looking at data always in the same way, then you're wasting a lot of resources, okay? So the first thing you should have an eye on is how stable is your data? The easy thing is you have something like a log, you're creating data once, you're writing it down and you're just never touching it. So maybe you are asking for it, you are querying it, but it's not modified, it's not associated, whatever. It's really just writing it down once, okay? Let's say it's some kind of code. Then the next is you have this uh, data in the sliding window that is hot, okay? Can't be a germ forest. No, 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 it's not a germ forest. I'm here in the Swedish woods, by the way, I just saw it in the chat. Um, you have the sliding window of hot data. It means even if you have terabytes of data, you have just a few hundred megabytes or gigabytes that are hot actively changed, modified, edited, queried, and all this stuff. So your strategy to make it performant is not about over the whole data, it's just about the sliding window. Maybe this makes things really, really easy instead of just um, thinking about the whole data, the amount of data. And then the worst case is uh, for sure all data is hot. So that means you're just writing tons of data and Occurring, editing, deleting everything, okay? There's a big change here. If it is allowed to delete data, that's one of the big key questions. So if you are able to 
to say, okay, I'm just adding and modifying data, but I'm never deleting data, then it's way easier to do something than with deletion as well. But having in mind that you have these different um, amounts of data that is hot, modified, edited, whatever, then the next question is, how to navigate through this data. What, what are the possibilities you need? And what are the possibilities that, that will give you this persistence layer? So for example, think about I'm accessing this plain SQL. I have this uh, language I have to learn. I'm formulating an amount based on different attributes or whatever. And then I'm sending this query to the database engine. It will aggregate all this stuff, do the magical stuff for me, and then giving me back the result, okay? The same for graph databases is Cypher, more or less. You're navigating with a declarative statement, or more or less declarative. And uh, another way could be, for example, streams. You're just iterating over data, saying, okay, this I need, this I'm transforming, and so on and so on. So you have different ways to access data. And the big question is, what, what is really the, the way to access and modify this data that fits your needs? For example, the SQL. SQL is an old thing since the 70s. It is not bad. I don't want to say that's bad. Uh, but um, the main thing here is, you have to learn a different language. You have to reformulate your questions and you have to declare what you need instead of just saying, I need the next one or so. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. It really depends on the behavior of the developer, but it would be perfect if you have maybe both possibilities. Well, on the other side, if you want to have a less semantic break, it would, it would make sense if you're in a language that you're using the language itself to formulate your query. How this is executed is a different beast, okay? But um, using the language itself to formulate the query is a big plus. So the next thing is, if you're talking about data and you have big complex object graphs, then you should have an eye on how many of these attributes do I need? Do I need access to everything? Do I need it immediately or later? The next question is, do I have calculated fields? Do I need it in my query language, navigation language, to do calculations on the fly? Something like dynamic views. So it means uh, semi-persistent views on uh, big unstructured data. So we have different questions here you should think about to identify what is really the necessary functionality you need and what can you get, just get rid of, okay? Because everything you can get rid of, just don't do it, okay? Because it just makes it complicated, makes it slow and don't do it. Okay, so what is object-oriented persistence? So um, object-oriented persistence means more or less, you have an object graph, in this example, maybe I have a car with engine, with some cylinders, with a wheel, with whatever. And this car is your business logic or your business app. And you just want to say store, okay? So this is more or less object-oriented position. So really having this object in mind. This approach about object-oriented positions is, I don't know, is a, a big way for steering the 90s, beginning of 2000, I think, a bunch of object-oriented database management systems. Huh? And they all spoke about how to formulate data in an abstract object-oriented way. We have different implementations of this stuff. And yeah, well, so here, just a tiny example in Java. What does it mean? I have my class whatever language features I'm able to use with record, without record or whatever. And here I'm just using this example. For example, there's a car with an attribute engine and this engine has a list of cylinders, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so it's, it's just a plain formulation of, I want to store the data for my business logic in exactly this way. So um, the next question is inside the object oriented world, mostly developers are thinking about to formulate the object-oriented model in itself. But they are not thinking about how to formulate a holder for a bunch of them. For example, if I need a car in my application and I have to deal with a bunch of cars, mostly there is just a list of cars and all the other stuff is magically done inside 
the positions layer. Give me a bunch of cars, give me cars with this attribute and so on and so on. And this magic, what you have inside the positions layer with the trade-off of having SQL in, pro in the process communication and all this stuff would be now part of your object-oriented model up here um, because you, you need this. Okay, and the most people just thinking about modeling the single entity, but not the whole of the entity. And this is more or less where we have to go through if you are talking about how to make things performant. Okay, so if I have this one, I have immediately the challenge between one to one, one to many, many to many associations, and I have immediately the challenge of if it is unidirect, uh, directional or bidirectional. So how can I navigate? Can I navigate from the cylinder to the engine? If yes, the language have to give me the possibility to go along this connection, along this graph. And in Java, we have to formulate it in both ways. Huh? Get engine and at cylinder, get, um, get at cylinder, I have to say get engine and at uh, cylinder, I have to say get cylinder. So um, here in this example, it's interesting to see because if I have a bunch of cylinders, I would have a combination of an engine will give me a list of cylinders and then I'm selecting the cylinder out of it. And on the other side, every cylinder will have a direct connection to the engine. So what, what's going on here is if I'm doing it too complex, I have a huge graph with cycles, endless cycles, and all this stuff must be maintained. Okay, so this is something that is increasing the complexity of of object-oriented positions because there is no decomposition like in SQL. Okay. Okay, so object-oriented positions and the difference to object-oriented database management systems. Object-oriented database management systems, what they had in the history was this approach. We have, for example, stuff like SQL. And we have this abstract description language, and we have to de decompose the whole model always to tables, and then this association tables and all this stuff. Okay, so if if I have this one, the next logical step at the universities was now I'm creating exactly this object-oriented uh, version out of it. So what they have done is they created a language independent from technology, this object query language, and they called it OQL, similar to SQL, and it was mostly an external process. It was exactly designed in the same way. So you had this object-oriented database. It was a project uh, pro um, process. It was installed, and immediately you had all these challenges, uh, what you had with SQL types that are not fitting together, how to formulate a different abstract uh, description language, a query language, and so on and so on and so on. And immediately you had a, the model transformation again. And it turned out that this is a dead horse. Okay, they, they tried it with a lot of venture capital and it's, uh, there was commercial ones, open source ones. It was really a hype, okay. But this abstract description, independent from the language, was mostly leading to performance issues. And this performance issues was mostly related exactly to this point that they had this huge or this huge amount of cycles inside this object tree. And this was just not, this, you're not able to, to implement it performant, okay? So, and this was mostly the dead of all this object-oriented database management systems. So lesson learned is, if you want to have object-oriented positions, this should be implemented in exactly the language I want to use, okay? Because this abstract model, we were never able to solve this performance issues in object-oriented database management systems. So there is no space so far for these systems because we are not able to tackle all these technical challenges at this point. So if we want to have object-oriented positions, then we need object-oriented positions instead of object-oriented database management systems, okay? With this language independent stuff. Okay, so going back to um, uh, what, yeah, here's, here's just a slide is explaining what, what I said before. I have this object model, then I have this transformation, this model mapping and so on and so on. And I try to get this semantic equal implementation. But if you have, for example, 
back to this example where I have an engine with a, with a list of cylinders and then I'm grabbing a cylinder out of this list and from every cylinder I can go back to the engine. The challenge here with this abstract implementations is that you have to reformulate. So what would be the way to transform this model? Would it be the way that you're modeling exactly the object-oriented model like in your language, like one entity is going to a list of entities, is going to an entity and from this entity back to the main entity, jumping over the list, okay? Or if it is really in a way that, that you are saying to every engine and cylinder back, so, so what, what is a way of mapping? Okay, so we don't need this uh, ideas anymore. So we got the point that there's uh, bidirectional mappings and, and the cycles in this object graph was more or less a disaster. So for us, it's more or less, oh, one thing I want to highlight here is, okay, so we, we know that we have to get rid of this uh, neutral stuff. On the other side, the technical implementation uh, long days ago was that um, there's mostly, most implementations of object-oriented persistence if it is an object-oriented um, database management system or an implementation in the uh, impl uh, language itself was mostly uh, realized or implemented with specific interfaces. So there were some ODB mass uh, on the market in Java, but uh, it was necessary that you are implementing a dedicated interface or you have to um, yeah, use an abstract base class or whatever. So it was more or less, um, they they had requirements for the object-oriented model. So it, it was immediately in vendor login, okay? And this was not good. So uh, good for the vendor, not good for you. So if, if you want to have an uh, independent solution without vendor login, it's good if you have your model and no additional stuff, or at least the minimum additional stuff that you have to fulfill for technical requirements to have the solution. Okay, so the old Java implementations like DB4O and all this stuff, um, they push you to dedicated uh, hierarchies and all this stuff. Okay, so then there's this difference, just a few words about this relational database management system. They are very performant, okay? Relational database management system, they, they are working since the 17th and they have optimizations enormous what they got out of it, okay? But again, we have mostly to get the most performance out of it, there's a vendor specific SQL elements. If you're just mapping with plain SQL, mostly it's not so efficient. So again, you have this vendor login because inside this transformation in the same way what I mentioned with the object oriented database management systems, you have this, um, yeah, usage of special functions of special uh, types and all this stuff, okay? So um, I would say this is everything what we try to get rid of. The same with this relational database, just an overview here. You have this object model, you have to break it in tables. We know this, it's nothing, uh, nothing new. And um, yeah, so if you want to have an object-oriented pattern that is performance, you have to go back to the basics of how to speeding up searches. I'm just talking about searches, because if you are thinking about the inverted thing, you can do the same thing for updates, okay? So even if I'm talking here just about speeding up searches, means that you can do more or less the same thing to speed up modifications, okay? If it is necessary, but I'm focusing here on speeding up searches. Having in mind that you have a list of attributes and you just want to have one element out of it, the uh, brute force you take is just, as you know, going over the whole list, selecting the necessary, and that's it. This is good if you have a small amount of data. That's good. So it makes no sense to have just, uh, let's say, 100 elements and then start playing around with different data structures. Not makes no sense. If you have just a few, maybe a few thousand elements, it's freaking fast. If you're just going with your stream over it, and if it's done quite often, it's it's just fast enough. So it makes no sense to make the model more complicated, or it makes no sense to to have technical overhead to try to get something out of it. Yeah? Mostly, this is good. Okay. The first thing what you can do to speed up searches, if you remember ah, there at the university, there was something, is that you start 
implementing a dedicated search strategy. A search strategy can be based on, for example, the data that is structured or ordered in a dedicated way. For example, you're sorting this data and then you know, okay, if it is bigger or smaller, I'm going left, I'm going right and so on and so on. So we have this different search strategies based on the expectation that data is in a certain order. And this means that I have now two things. I haven't speed up in searches. I have the trade-off in yeah, sorting the stuff or bringing this stuff in a certain amount of, uh, or in, in, in a dedicated order. And mostly if you have, and now we are back in the beginning of the session, oh, I have hot data, I have cold data, I have data that is modified quite often and so on and so on. If the amount of modifications is above a certain threshold, then this strategy is just slower than just going through the whole list, okay? Going through the whole list and uh, searching for it. And where the order is, you really have to find out by yourself. So you have to measure it, make sense to sort it and then to, to search, or it's easier with this amount of modifications that are just going plain through the whole list. Sometimes a mixed strategy is not bad, okay? But the really speed up of object-oriented models is some kind of decomposing. And then we are back to this, what we had before. We have some technical needs or algorithmic needs to speed up. And the fastest search more or less, or one of the fastest implementation of search, and this is where the whole famous thing of Google is based on is more or less and then inverted metrics, okay? So what, what you're doing here is that you are, you know, what is a question? And this is the important thing. You need to know what the question is you want to ask. If you know what the question is and how often this question will be formulated against your model, then you can start building inverted metrics for exactly this query. And this is something that is a little bit tricky. So you have to identify, you have this model. You're modeling this one in, in a way that it fits or that it's accurate for your, for your data itself. But then if you want to speed up, you need to know what is a query, what is a question I have, and then I can exactly for this question build an inverted matrix. It's more or less a half map, okay? Uh, the stuff here is you have to maintain this hash map because if you're asking a hash map that it's not valid to the current state of the model, then it makes no sense. On the other side, you can start thinking about atomic questions. So if you have a bunch of questions, again, this model, and they are more or less based on some basic questions, again, this model, what you can do is that you're formulating this atomic questions and based on this sub results, you're implementing your next strategy. For example, just plain text going over the list or whatever. Um, and this is the thing that, that you should have in mind the balance between implementing all possible queries against the system, against a partially implemented query against the system, and then just doing the, the rest in, in, in plain language. Okay. So in source code, how it would look like if you are just in plain Java. So I have here, for example, this car with an engine, has some cylinders and some wheels and all this stuff. Um, the first query would be something like the stream, okay? Out of the root node, this whole of the whole object graph, I'm saying, okay, give me all cars, building a stream, filtering it with something. And then you see, ah, the, I have here the car with get wheels, get size. So I have this getter, getter, getter stuff. Then I'm comparing and I'm filtering and giving the result. What I'm completely ignoring at this point is that you have to deal sometimes with immutable lists and all this stuff, okay? I'm just going over the plain idea. So this is the easy thing. Okay, how it would like, uh, or what, what do we need? At this point, you need access to all cars, you need access to all wheels, you're going over the whole data. It means it can be very fast. <laughs> it can be very slow with, a certain amount of attributes if you have this get a get a get a get a thing. Okay, so what would be the next thing? Um, what you can do 
if you have the question against this model, give me all cars with four cylinders. If this is a question, you have to ask this model quite often. What you should do is you should have an attribute inside your car, the amount of cylinders, okay? Because then you are not going of the whole cylinders, counting them, blah, 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 okay? So it means at this car, at this level car, if you're asking on the car level, then it would make sense to aggregate there this attribute, okay? This is more or less what you should do or what you can do, but in the same way, you have again, this getter, getter, getter thing. So what I want to say at this point is, the query or the question you have against this model will be based on dedicated levels inside this object graph. And inside this object graph, you have to identify where is the best place to formulate this query. For example, if you want to build an inverted matrix of all cars with four cylinders, what is the right place to store this inverted matrix, this hash map? It could be, for example, the hash map. Okay, inside the hash map in root node. So inside the root nodes and hash map, and then you are giving it a meaningful name and that's it, okay? That's, that's okay. On the other side, if you want to have some, some queries formulated, what you can do is you can prepare something where the query is uh, pushed through and just prepare a bunch of predicates that you're using. So you're formulating an object way, object-oriented way the questions. Then you have this interface where you can push these predicates through. And then it's, it's a trade-off between um, coding convenience and um, yeah, performance, more or less. On the other side, um, if you have now these subtrees, so I'm, I want to have all cars with this attribute, with this attribute, then you can go a little bit further so that you say, oh, I'm, I'm implementing these attributes or these holders or these pre-calculated things a little bit further down in the object model. But with this, we have immediately this trade-off that is shown here. If you have, for example, here this root node, this add car, immediately what you have to do is some kind of transactional behavior. You have to update all these uh, inverted metrics, then you have to update the model, and then you're done. And the same with remove, okay? So this is not too complicated to implement. You have to think about if this part of the model is okay, if it is not transactional, Oh, okay, what, what happened if, if something is breaking left and right? But in the end, it's more or less exactly this. So you're going there, you're having this holder, you're modifying it, and this you have to do on all places. So what we are doing here at this point is more or less we are implementing partially something what is a database management system doing for you. This is what you are doing for yourself, but you can do it in a very fine-grained way. Okay, then... What's the difference between a uh, central or local index management? The main thing here is that if you have a big amount of data, you can have one root node where all the data is uh, going through, and then you can implement all the queries at this point. But I, I recommend don't, don't do it in bigger graphs because it's just not maintainable. Then you have this huge hot root node where all this stuff is going through and it's more or less not maintainable. What you should do is inside your object graph, identified clusters, inside these clusters, you can start with this accessors or however you want to call it. So that you say, um, I have now a car, a car is for me a unit. I want to hold as, as one dedicated thing. Oh, blueberries, endless blueberries, oh, perfect. Um, and then you, you're concatenating or you're building a hierarchy of this dedicated um, clustered object parts. And this is more or less what you should do. Okay, rules are some pros and cons. Um, what should I say here? The, if you have some kind of query language, then you have always this uh, technical or if the implementation is out of your main language, you have always this technical challenge of types and, and data structures that are not matching together. On the other side, if, if you're dealing with microstream, and this is why I started giving this talk, is really because this microstream is solving 
advantage of these challenges because it's, it is in, inside the language Java, okay? It will give you the, the possibility to formulate the language more or less in different JVM languages. So if, if you have this index management and you have this place where you can put through a predicate, okay, then more or less a predicate itself can be implemented in something you know, that is inside the JVM runnable, okay? So you would have a superset, okay, um, that you can use to formulate languages based on your needs or based on your preferred, um, yeah, what, what you like more or less, okay? So, and this, this is a good thing. So SQL is always uh, a subset. Microstream is at this point a superset. And this is a cool thing, but you are inside your language. Uh, the trade-off with Microstream is that you have to deal with transactions or more or less you have to deal with, um, with this index management by yourself. But if you're in the beginning very strict and removing all the, the things you don't need, I don't need to have access to all data because I have just a sliding window active and so on and so on. You can dramatically reduce the complexity of this implementation. And mostly it ends up in plain Java that is written down in, in really a, a very short amount of time. So this is more or less what, what is a good thing here. And um, yeah, I think a lot of other stuff about microstream you will hear at this conference. Uh, it's easy to try out. And uh, yeah, so at this point, um, I'm more or less done with core cool things. I would be open for, for questions now. And otherwise, I have late a second talk about supply chain security. So if, you, if you're interested in this and go to my next talk, I think it's in a few hours. I have to check, I think, for uh, two o'clock or so. Okay, so any questions? So I will check the chat if I have something in the chat. Where's the chat? I have to rotate this one, otherwise I'm not seeing it. Chat, okay, so then, yeah, green IT, that's right. Green IT is here, I'm in the middle of nowhere and it's perfect. I'm just recording a bunch of new videos for my YouTube channel, by the way. So, can't be the German forest, yeah, that's right. The stable internet connection is just able in, in Sweden. Not in Bavaria? No, not in Bavaria, definitely not. So then, so done. YouTube channel and so on and so on. So no dedicated questions. Okay, so then, thank you very much for attending. If there's any other question, feel free. You can, yeah. Ask me via Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever. And uh, yeah, so back to the studio. Sorry.